for tuning in to your day off podcast hosted by your boys Corey and tony i think by the end of today i might have another best friend they're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry one podcast at a time uh you're going to grab a lot of information yeah you're going to learn a lot presented by hair district ladies and gentlemen this is it your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors My name is Corey, and I'm sitting with my best friend, Britt Siva, today. Uh, and Tony. And Tony. <laughs> <laughs> here as well. But uh, what's up, buddy? I, I'm used to it. It's all good. Dude, I'm telling you, when Britt's in the room, mm, you kind of get pushed back. Yeah, back Britt, Michael, and so-and-so. Just give it a listen. Yeah. When he gets the back burner, too. <laughs> uh-uh. That's awesome. I'm excited, man. I, I always get, uh, we were just chatting before, like I always get so excited to talk to Britt because um, literally we have no idea what we're going to talk about today, which uh, I think that's going to make it just a fantastic conversation. Yeah. And every time we all get together and just even the pre-talk, you know what I mean? It, it just, we just go and yeah. it just, we get sucked in and Next thing you know, it's like 20 minutes into pre-talk. I'm like, hold on, let's get into the podcast. Exactly. You know, what's funny is like we, we have such a good pre-talk that like we we should probably record that, to be honest, because we we forget to kind of start the podcast because we just like we're just sitting around chatting and, and, and stuff like that. And it's funny because first time guests, it'll be like, oh, are we recording? No, we're not recording. All right. You know what I mean? Like they get so deep into it exactly exactly yeah i know sometimes some of our best conversations are off air which you know doesn't make sense but right. you know what we'll the we we'll have to figure that all out so uh I, I don't know i don't know where we're going so should we just jump in yeah let's do it let's do it hello my favorite friend Britt siva welcome to your home. welcome my back favorite I should friends. Say, right? oh thank you it's like coming home you know it's just like getting back together with your old college roommates that's how it feels every single time and i just have to echo what y'all said i don't, I don't know if everybody knows this but like there's a ton of incredible educators in the industry and a ton of amazing, you know, insights and just brilliant minds. And every once in a while you meet people where you just feel like, oh, it's easy. It's effortless. The connection's there. And what, what we were saying earlier, like in the free show that everybody missed, which is the best part and people have no idea, <laughs> is that like what I love about what I love about us is that we don't align on everything. It's not that we agree on every single thing, but we have enough like respect for each other to like get into a debate or to just uh, see another perspective perhaps like i've learned so much from y'all too and i just i really always enjoy being in the room with you so thank you for holding space it's a true joy Brett, I, I i echo everything you said and, and you know even about like the debates it, it, it's so cool and i think like i think it's such a lesson right now because the yeah. world is so weird where like where we put ourselves in these camps and then like we have to def- we have to defend the camp whether we believe it or not you know and and, and i love the fact that we can just go in and, and just have common you know what it is brett hmm. we've actually never ever met isn't that wild it that seems crazy? impossible and it's crazy right we've never actually met but but that's a true friend that you can like chop it up with and there's no feelings afterwards. So true. And that, that, to what you said, like, those are the relationships we should all crave and chase. Like if somebody can't be honest with you or, or lay it all out there, that's not a real friendship. That's just like a one-sided conversation or something like that. And we need more of this, the real talk. And I, I totally agree. I think not just the industry, but just like humans at large, it's very much like it's hard to find people who are willing to like see another side or get into a debate or perhaps admit that they're wrong. And I feel like we have such a great dynamic in that. And I want more of it all the time. Yeah. I'm I'm the same way. Cause you know, I think we've talked about this once before about, you know, say if you're heading to a destination, there's more than one road to get there, you know? And just because you take a different route to get there, doesn't mean that I have to hate on you. You know what I mean? We're all going to the same place. Yeah, it's this weird like human tribal thing that we all get caught up in, you know. And like and like one of my one of my uh I don't know lessons or practices that that I've been working on for I don't know like four or five years now. Actually, this this is a funny segue, is that I, I'm trying not to be connected to outcome, right? Mm. So like 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 if I can just like enjoy the journey, not have not not have goals. That's not what that means, you know what I mean? But just not be connected to to the uh to the outcome of, of of different things. Now I will tell you I fail at this way more than I'm successful at it. However, here's the side card to it. I don't really care about sports anymore. Right. Mm. And it's not and it's not and I'm not purposefully not caring about it. It's just not I'm just not connected to it anymore. 
you know, I'm not connected or I'm not, I'm not, I grew up as a Dallas Cowboys fan, but I'm not connected to like having to defend. Well, that makes sense. That, that, that makes, that yeah, makes, exactly. Throw yeah. that right in the trash can. That was easy. Fair enough. But, 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 but it's interesting that, that I just, I can't even muster up enough energy to be like, I care about this. I mean, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, totally. It, it, it doesn't, I mean, you know, you kind of appreciate it. It's a game now. It's not necessarily a part of, you know, how you identify. That's it. That's it. You mm. just nailed it. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's like it's not it's not a part of my identity anymore being friends I with is a part of my identity right oh, likewise likewise <laughs> i i think i think you just hit such a key point of like first of all the disconnecting from the outcome is something i've been working on too so as you said that i was like oh see this is where i love you guys i completely agree and it's hard but it's so healthy and i just recently like last weekend I was negotiating some kind of opportunity and it was exciting. And my husband was like, okay, how are you going to feel if it doesn't come together? And I was like, well, I'll just be, I'll be fine. It's whatever. Like I'm excited about it, but if it doesn't come together, that's okay too. And he could not understand it. And he was like, no, you should like be fired up. And I was like, no, it's not that I'm not fired up, but I'm not going to get so emotionally invested in the outcome that I start making weird decisions on the journey. And like, I sacrifice the journey to achieve the outcome. You know how we all do that sometimes too. And then you end up making really tragic choices. So yeah, you get the prize at the end, but the prize wasn't actually what you wanted because you went through so much pain in an effort to get there. And I think so many people make that mistake so often. I think, you know what? I think, I think that there's a parallel to this to like salon ownership and stuff, right? Oh gosh. Yeah. You get caught up in, you get caught up in the details and you get caught up in like, what's, what's not fun about it. Yes. You kind of, that you kind of forget you know, why you're doing this in the first place. I think it's a little bit, it's being connected to the why and less connected with, with how to get there. So true. And I think that we are in this era. I've talked about this a lot. I think y'all have too, like this burnout era where there's this like huge energy and culture of burnout in our industry. And we have no one to blame, but ourselves for that. Like we all fed into it. We got caught up the FOMO. We want to be at everything, do everything, keep up with everyone. And then you look around, you're like, I'm keeping up with who, like what? And I think we're just now at this place where everyone's eyes wide open to like, whoa, how did I get here? I think there's almost this like great awakening that's happening. And we, we do have to wake up a little bit and say, but what am I doing it all for? When you said like, what's the why connecting to that? I think that's the big season we're in right now. I, I love that. Did you, um, we posted an article last week. I don't know if you saw it or not, but, um, it was done by refinery 29, um, on the, on, on Apple. And it was, it's, uh, the name of the article is trauma dumping is real and your hairdresser needs you to stop doing it. Um, mm. it's, it, it's a really, really great article. Now I'm going to be honest. I don't, I've been doing hair for 30 years and I don't, I didn't feel connected as connected to the article as many probably were. Like, I don't feel like I take stuff home with me or, you know, I, I'm pretty good at like being able to separate that stuff. And, 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 and to be honest, without being way controversial, I don't know if that's a gender thing or I don't know if that's a, it, it, I don't know what that is, but I don't, I, I care about people and like, like I'm an empath and, and all, I hate even saying that, but you know what? I have empathy for people and, and I certainly will like a prime example is one of my clients, they were interviewing to get into a private school and I texted her that day and I go, Hey, good luck with today. You know? So, so there was that, but I didn't feel but I didn't feel connected to that to where it was going to ruin my day. I don't know. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times, I don't know. We like, we do have coworkers or we've had coworkers where they get so caught up in today's, whatever, if it's political or, you know, schools or whatever it is, and they get so wrapped up into it, it, they, they have a conversation in the morning and they keep having the same conversation conversation with yeah. every single client they're just dumping it dumping it dump and it, 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 it's real yeah it is real and i think that we are in this world where listen there's a lot of chaos and there's a lot of really wild stuff going on and we have access to media in a way that we've never had before and it is to what you're saying so easy to trauma dump all day long and especially i don't know what it is about sitting in a stylist chair where you're like perfect this is the place for me to unleash everything and it is that emotional exhaustion that so many stylists wear i love the article i'm going to go back and read it because i haven't read it yet i'm curious did they have any advice on the flip side of like what a stylist should do if a client does start trauma dumping no but interesting enough going into october we are um we're, we're actually i'll give this to you too we're dedicating the entire month of october to inner health 
So Love the, that. So, so we're going to do a uh, four or five podcast that month. Um, actually with our friend, Michael Cole, he's going to come back mm. on and talk, and talk about his sobriety story again, but not like, not just like, like last time we had the conversation, it was about him being sober. Now, now the conversation, we're moving the conversation a little bit more towards like how to stay sober and what, and, and what, what are the mental, um, the mental health aspects to, to staying sober or building guardrails and stuff like that. Not to get us derailed. Anyways. Mm. Yes. So the entire week, honestly, this is so crazy, Britt. And I don't know if, if, if as a pot, well, you don't do guests anymore, but, but as a podcast, I put this I put this article on on my on our, our Instagram the other day and I booked the entire month of October in about an hour because so many people reached out about it like we need to talk about this we need to talk about that so to, to bring you back into the conversation is that we're gonna have we're gonna we're gonna have this conversation four times next month and and it, it's not and we're just gonna we're gonna explore it you know not not necessarily what to do what not to do or whatever but but i will tell you this the article definitely reminded me of a podcast that we did with maureen about uh, i forget maureen's last name anyways doesn't matter um she's she was a grief coach or, or and, and she it was such a great conversation because she was able to kind of walk us through you know if a client drops grief on your lap what do you do with that energy is this she your family <laughs> So uh anyway, anyways, um uh uh sort of. <laughs> uh she was married to my cousin. So Oh, was... your cousin in law. Ex cousin. Yeah, but they're not married anymore. Yeah. So like I know her. Oh, yeah. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I'll bring it back home, you guys. I you know what I think is so great is that you're just normalizing the conversation about like mental health, mental well-being, sobriety, like hard conversations you're like but let's just have it like let's just create space to have it so what if it's hard it doesn't mean we don't do it we don't talk about it and you're right and the freedom of that you give people when you talk about things like grief like this taboo topic that we're not supposed to talk about that is something all of us as humans will experience in our lifetime and so to not talk about mental health emotional well-being we are cheating ourselves and everybody around us to not have those conversations yeah I know when we had the conversation with her, I mean, literally that same week, I utilized uh, what she, what we've talked about. I had a client who, who uh, lost her spouse and normally, you know, I would like, oh, you know, my condolences and then try to kind of stay away from that because I, I don't know what to talk about. And um, what, what one of the things that she taught us was, you know, they might not have anybody to talk to, you know what I mean? So uh, I asked, I just asked a simple question and she just opened up and at the end of that appointment, she gave me a hug and said, thank you so much. She goes, you know, she's been carrying that inside and she hasn't been able to release it or let it out. And it was just so special, so beautiful. But yeah, I mean, just giving people permission to, to, to open up like that. It was, it was incredible. Okay. I love that you actually just shared that because I have to ask, like, did that feel like an emotional burden for you to carry? Uh, to, to avoid it or to, to, to listen to her, to hear her heart. Not at all. Not, not at all. Not, 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 and not I, I, at all. And I expected you to say that like, no, it didn't feel like an emotional burden. And I think that because you had the tools and because maybe because you knew what to ask or you know how to approach it, it's like that could have felt emotionally heavy to a person, but you knew how to manage it. And, and listen, you were in the driver's seat on that one. You had the skills and the know how to manage it so that you could be there for her without taking the burden on yourself. Absolutely. And, and if, if she would have done that prior to the conversation that I had with, that we had with Maureen, it might've felt that way. Cause I, 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 I didn't, I didn't know how to navigate it or I didn't know how to, to handle that, you know, but after that conversation, yeah, it just, I was just shocked that, Hey, here it is. And Hey, let's have this conversation. And it was, it was, it was, beautiful actually it was really really touching and think about how much like deeper she feels to you now too mm -hmm. absolutely you know, yeah mm -hmm. yeah I don't, yeah again i i think the article is important and and just to kind of like rephrase it you know it was it was about clients dumping on us not necessarily yeah. us dumping on on them right you know, which we've seen too right we've seen that in the salon too you know <laughs> but, but <laughs> brit just held up her praise hand <laughs> but um you know we've definitely seen that as well um you know kind of my go-to especially if i especially if i know like just recently we had a client who um whose 40 year old husband passed away um but like when she came in you know what i told her i was like i was like, this is your appointment we'll talk as much or as little as you want you know i'm just I'm, I'm here as a sounding board or i'm here to forget about it too like i don't i don't feel like i i need to i need to bring anything that she doesn't want to bring 
Mm-hmm. That also made it easy too, because the last thing you want to do is sit around and like, what do we talk about? Like, 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 you know, it's like when you go to a funeral and you go, Hey, how you doing? And you're like, you know, exactly how they're doing. You know what I mean? But it kind of broke down that conversation and, and, it, and it let it, let it, and, and I don't, you know, to that point, I don't know how burdened they are by, by, by coming in. You know what I mean? So anyways, that's, that's my go-to line. Like we'll talk as much or as little as you want to at your appointment. I love that. And I think that to what y'all were saying, like you creating the space to have these conversations and the more any and all of us get educated experienced are not afraid to step into the area of learning about these uncomfortable things, the less uncomfortable and the less burdensome they are. And even like thinking about the trauma dumping and I truly, I had not read the article, so I have zero context, but thinking about it, it's like, if, if a stylist were in a position where they're like, oh my gosh, this client is giving, giving me too much more than I can hold. Like maybe their cup is emotionally full today. And the stylist just has no more left to give. I think it's okay for the stylist to be like, I so want to unpack this with you. Like, I think it's okay for the stylist to navigate the conversation in a way that serves them too. Like just as humans, like if you, if you two were to come on this podcast and want to talk about something I didn't want to talk about, I would truly just steer the conversation somewhere else. And I think, and I don't know that you'd feel offended by that, but I think that the more we as stylists even have tools to be like, whoa, I need to take this a different direction today, the healthier our mental health could be too. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think, I think the big takeaway from that is exactly is to, by the way, they mentioned that in the article mm. about, about not just steering it away, but like, Hey, listen, I don't have the space for this. So let's move, let, let's move on. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, I don't even know where I was going with that. I just lost it. But anyways, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No, <laughs> it no, sounded no. like you were saying that, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. So uh, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Next. Yeah. Next. <laughs> next that's so funny um no but it's a great article so if you're listening in it was refinery 29 i got it right off of apple it was actually sent to me and then you know i put it up and it, it kind of blew up a little bit but um it's a great article and once again let me get the name for you uh trauma dumping is real and your hairdresser needs you to stop doing it um but yeah definitely read the article i think it's fantastic right last thought on that it just pinged for me i was teaching a class this morning and i happened to point the question I, we were talking about I don't know, not this. We're talking about something else. And I happened to pose the question. I said, has anybody finished a day at the salon and gone home and said to your family, like, nobody talked to me. I need quiet time for an hour. You know how it's like you get home to your family, which is supposed to be your like sanctuary. We're like, oh my gosh. And we picture like running into our spouse's arms and the kids jumping into our laps. And sometimes you're like, no, ever, nobody touched me. Nobody talked to me. It's like, it shouldn't be that way. But because we carry these emotional burdens and that should be like a trigger to somebody. Like if you're a stylist or salon owner and it's okay, we've all been there. That's why we can talk to it. But if you're having more days where it's like that, where you get home and you don't even have energy for your family, it's just a huge sign and indication that you're probably carrying too much emotional energy at work. Yeah. Definitely. I, I tell you what, I'm I'm grateful that we have a 40 minute um, commute home, you know, to decompress, I, I, just to decompress. Yeah. And that's what mm-hmm. it, that's, I think, I think that's more what it is than it is, you know, like, you know, energy wise, it's just a decompression of the day. Yeah. So critical. I, I have the same drive. And it's funny because I'll listen to a podcast on the way in, but then it's silent coming home. I don't know. Radio. Same. I'm, Isn't that such a trip? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because your mind is like full, like there's no more now. Like, I'm all done. <laughs> you have a podcast in your head going on. Right. right. <laughs> it's true. It's true. The That's funny. Stuff. That's yeah. so funny. You know, I, but you know, like even Trump, I'm, we're going to move the conversation down a little bit, but like, like, I like, I like, I stopped watching the news and stuff because, oh, yeah. And the conversation that I've had with myself, why I stopped doing that, and Tony will tell you, is that I'm not mature enough to watch the news and then carry on with my day. I'm not mature enough. It has nothing to do with the news, it has nothing to do with what's out there, but, but I had to recognize that, like, I can't move on past it. So I've just got to stop doing it. And, and and maybe it's a little bit of like head in the sand type stuff, but that's what I need because because I can't recover from it. No, Corey, I don't think that's head in the sand. I think that's self-awareness, which I've done a podcast on this too. Like most of us really struggle with self-awareness. Like being self-aware is very difficult. And then we do things like you just did where you're like, well, maybe I'm just sticking my head in the sand. And like w- often when we're faced with our own self-awareness, we almost make excuses or like, but maybe I shouldn't do that. And it's like, no. Like be present to what you're feeling, know what your body and your head and whatever needs. And it's okay to just say, no, that's not for me. But a lot of us lack that self-awareness or that confidence to make those decisions. I commend you for that. I think that's great. Well, yeah, I, I'm very similar to you because I, I, I don't watch it because I don't necessarily trust it. You know, I don't, you, watch can't. It, you know what I mean? Cause it, you know, they'll show a seven second clip and you're like, oh, wow. 
but then you watched a whole 20 minute clip of it you're like and well, uh, the context is different right? completely context. Different. so i'm like yeah. people are just using what they want to to fuel their agenda or to fuel right. their their ratings or whatever and i'm like yeah i don't want to be a part of any of that you know what i mean so and, I, by the way my head in the sand comment was about like about the world not about me yeah okay yeah, you know yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like yeah. is it my head in the sand because i'm not paying attention to the world which and, and by the way when you were in DC and, you know, everybody is, everybody is adjacent to politics. So, you know, it becomes a big conversation um, in, in the salon um, it always has, you know, but, uh, but, but here's, what's great. It's like, this is my go-to now is I go, I, I don't watch the news. Do you think there's a disadvantage to saying that or doing that? No, no, it just moves the conversation on, you know, even, yeah. even if it's a conversation I don't want to have, I mean, I, listen, I fail at that sometimes too. You know, I, I jump into conversations that uh, 30 minutes later, I'm like, well, I, I might even have that conversation. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. But you know, but I'm only human, <laughs> you know, but, but for I the most question. part, only yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. Part. do y'all ever feel the pressure to like know everything or be everything or be an expert of like all the stuff, like to really like be very aware of like so much and it's hard to keep up with everything. Uh, I'm an expert at what I'm an expert at. I do not feel any mm. pressure at all um, to feel that. Listen, I'm a, I'm a jump two feet in kind of like early adopter to everything. You um, are true. Yeah. So, so, you know, I, I like to be that sounding board to that, you know, so that's very cool to me, but you know, I, I don't feel like I have to be an expert on stuff that I'm not an expert on. No, I don't, I feel zero pressure of that at all. Yeah. Same. I mean, I don't, I mean, I have, I have a pretty, pretty solid clientele and, you know, and, uh, and they all know who I am, what I am. And, and they know, uh, where my heart lies and what I love. And, and especially as my grandbabies and my family and my friends. And, and that's where the majority of our conversation, uh, lies, you know what I mean? Uh, other than the client itself, but outside of the, anything like politics, news, whatever, I rarely ever get asked any of that because they know that that's not where I live. Okay. I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Do you feel like your clientele was always that way? Or do you feel like as you've become more confident, maybe as you've refined who it is you like to work with, that's kind of one of the benefits that's come along with it. Yeah. So it's, it's, I steer that conversation. So even though that's where my heart is, that's what I ask about them. Yeah. I mean, how are your grandbabies? How is, you know, things that I am that, that resonates deeply in me. I ask those questions about them. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair enough. And, and, but um, yeah, I think so, Brett. I mean, I think, and also I think that, you know, I mean, I've been doing hair for 30 years now, you know, so I've, I literally have clients that I've had for 25 or 30 years, you know, I've grown up with these people, you know, so, so it's a different conversation. If we're still talking about politics, then what are we doing? Right. Right. You know, right. so, so, so what are we doing in that? You know, um, now I definitely, I, I have a couple of clients, I have a couple of clients that I can't shut up about politics. Of course. Like I have, I have one who's a, who's a, who's a major player inside of DC and you know, all she wants to talk about is, is politics, but it kind of, but now it feels gross. It's like, oh, you know, but, um, so anyways, I have that, but, but for the most part, for the most part, yeah, it, it's not that unless you know, someone brings it up or something, but I try to move it on again. I, I, I kind of go like, I don't, I don't really watch the news. I mean, I can't really engage with you here and nobody wants to have a conversation by themselves, you know, but, I find that, but, also, I find but, this... I'm, but I'm also not in a position where they have to convince me of anything. Right. Because and that's it's that thing. That's what I'm finding to be interesting. Is like from the conversations I have with stylists, a lot of them almost feel like the clients run the show, like they're servants to the clients, which is not how I see how the relationship should be. But I think a lot of people are in that position where they'll say like, but that's what my client wants to talk about. Yeah, but so what that's not but that's not what you talk about so maybe you're not a match or maybe they just need to understand that there's like a different way of doing things and i think it actually is very like i love the way you both just explained it where it's like well when you sit in my chair i'm gonna ask about grandbabies because that's what's on my mind and so that's what i'm here to talk about i don't know about politics so we're not going to talk about it because it's not my area of expertise and i just the way y'all say that with such confidence i hope everybody listening realizes like you can have that too it's okay to just be who you are is enough and you don't have to play the character. Like you can just be who you are and your clients should love you just as you are. That's it. And I mean, I, to double down on what you're saying, if, if your relationship with your client is because of those conversations, then you're responsible for those conversations. There you go. Yep. You know, like you're responsible for that. And, and Tony will tell you, I was guilty of that for of that for years and years and years and years. Of course. And, you know, it's only been it's only been the last few years where I've kind of like, you know, disconnected from that, you know. Um, but I think we we just 
like I said, it feels much more family like than it does Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't fear those uh, Thanksgiving dinners, uh, uh, you know, anymore because I'm, well, I'm just not entertaining the conversation or I try to get out of it really quickly mm-hmm. for, for the most part. Again. Do you think those are things that come like with being senior to the industry? Like, not that y'all are seniors. You all are like super. We're turning this like, podcast off, Brent. Who very cool. No, I mean, like, oh, like, cool. like, ex- <laughs> <laughs> like experience in the industry. You know how, like, remember, like, I remember being new in the industry and I was just desperate and hungry and thirsty for clients where I was like, I'll do whatever, I'll be whatever. Sure. Do you think that culture still exists and like new stylists should still do and be whatever? as they're learning or do you think that new stylists should come in and be like but this is me so take me as i am what is your take on that and oh. or did you have a very different experience your first how quickly years? do my you first... want to build your book oh uh, so do you think the chameleon factor is still there i, I definitely think so yeah. you know I, I think i mean you're playing to you're playing to your audience now i don't think that that necessarily equals politics or those conversations no sure. make those parallel at all like i think that you, you can stand in that yeah, um, you stay in a little later you're coming in a little earlier you're taking the clients that are probably a little bit more challenging than, than the senior stylist is taking. You're taking those, those clients in, you're building your book. Mm-hmm. And uh, once you start building your book, then you can start shaking the tree and letting some of the leaves fall and make room for the clients that, that you want, that you want to connect. But at, at that stage, you really don't know which clients you, that you want. Here's the bottom line. You cannot complain. You cannot, refuse clients and complain about not making money mm. right you can't do both they're they're, 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 they're you, you have to do this you know you have to go through it there's absolutely clients that i absolutely hated doing that suck to do but you know you just did it because guess what my mortgage guy could care less that they're a pain in the ass you know what i mean so you know i, I don't think that you can do both if, if, if you're killing it and you've got all the clients that you want and all that stuff by all means you know build that build that client build that clientele but but um but as you're coming up, you know what though? There's also some big learns in that too. There's big learns on how to communicate. There's big learns on what you where you stand for. You know, so many times we don't know where we want to go in life, but we want to know what we want to avoid. And sometimes those clients is what mm. we want to avoid as well. You know, sometimes that's an easier Preach. conversation with yourself. You so know, true. but 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 at the end of the day, it comes down to like you can't complain about both. You can't complain about being like I know our whole career, like we had um, mainly female artists that were like, I'm not doing men's haircuts. And you're like, well, then when you're sitting in the back room while everyone else is doing men's haircuts, then you, you can't complain about not making money. You can't complain about not having a clientele. You know, you can't, you can't limit yourself. You've got to get out there and get it. Those stylists who were, cause I, I was the, that stylist. I know those stylists. We've been that person. Oh, but- what is it? You were that stylist in which way? Uh, that I would like, um, like for me, it was like bridal styling or like um, up to special occasion styles. Like there was plenty of business for that. And I was like, oh, I don't do that. But from the jump, I was like, I don't do that. And I can look back at like that young 20 something me and be like, well, girl, you should have put yourself in a class. But that's easy for me to say in 2023 now, because in 2007, putting myself in a bridal class is would be shockingly harder than it is today. Sure. So, you know, the educated me could could look back at the young me and be like, girl, take a class and quit making excuses. I didn't have those resources. I could have chased them out. There's no doubt about it. But I remember being that person being not even too good for it, but completely intimidated by it and not doing it. And I wish I could have gone back and like pulled a stylist aside and been like, I'm terrified a bridal help me. And I don't know if it's like an ego thing, but like, why don't more stylists say, I can't do a clipper cut to save my life. Can you, can I watch you do this cut right now? And I do think that there is maybe a stigma around that. Some people have no issue with that, but it's like the, the way to build confidence is by learning Ugh, always a hundred percent. But sometimes it's your heart desire. Like if you, if you went True. into the industry, you know what I mean? And that, that was not, that's okay. But your yeah. leader, your salon leader, your, your manager, your floor le- uh, leader, whoever that was running that particular salon at that time should have had those conversations with you. You know, right. what I mean? why don't you want to do it? Is it something that you're interested in? And maybe I can help you grow in that area to, to be more comfortable and, and confident in that area. Or is it something that you you don't even have any interest at all? Because if you don't have any interest at all, then it's like forcing you to do something that you don't want to do. Yeah, but Tony, I mean, I think that to kind of bring it all together too, though, it's like, like Britt said, like sometimes if it's something that you don't want, your ego takes over and be like, oh, that sucks. Like clipper cutting sucks. I don't want to do that. So you might not even be connected to like whether you want to do it or not. Or is it just your ego saying, because you're intimidated of it, you never go, I'm scared to do that. I'm intimidated to do that. It's, it, but, but 
but if you're cutting hair that's different right because or if you're you know if you're i don't know like to me wedding hair or styling for for brides it, it's a completely different it's like coloring it's like cutting it's it, it, you know it's a different compartment altogether yeah I agree to a degree. I think that I think all of these things that we're saying are true. I can remember like my own journey with men's cutting because I do think I don't know if it's just for female styles or all styles or whatever. It's intimidating because it's like sculpture. It's like a totally different way of cutting hair than like I would have my hair cut completely different. I was very intimidated by it. However, rather than hiding in the back break room and calling in sick when I had a bridal trial, if it was a men's cut, I would power through, I would learn. And then my men's cutting clients were still to this day, like my favorite clients. I'm so glad I got over that fear and pushed to learn because they were so fun. It was a lot easier in a lot of ways. I loved what I was doing because I pushed beyond the fear. So I think like to what you both said, like it can all be true. Some stuff we just need to actually like get in the arena and fight the fight. And sometimes I still probably wouldn't do bridal hair. And I think it all can be true, but it's like, how do you, how do you push enough to know what you're being resistant to and what you're just not your bag. I don't know. How do you know? I don't know how you figure that out. Trial and error. Age. Age. Isn't that the I mean, yeah. best and the worst? Yeah. It's so true. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, th there's a saying like the uh, uh, wisdom is, is, oh, no, I'm going to mess it up now. But it, uh, youth is plain is. I, I'm I know what you're saying. It's like, it's saying, about like youth is wasted. Is, with, you yeah. just wasted, right? Because yeah. you, you, with age comes the wisdom, but your body doesn't hold up to do what it used to do when you were 21 years old. It's true. Exactly. It's what true. do you think it is? Because I'm going to throw a dart and hopefully we hit something here. But but what do you think it is? Because so many times, again, in our 30 year career, so many times we've had like like a, a, a women or female artists that don't like to do men's haircut. You think it's about, because I kind of like think is like, is it about, the conversation is it about the intimidation of it is it what i'm saying is it more than just the actual skill you think that that's holding back I, or is I, it the relationship I, with men in general in cosmetology school you do not learn men's hair cutting at all right i mean you might do one pass of a clipper uh you know or a, maybe a short haircut but that's it everything else is on a long hair mannequin yes and, and the mannequin suck and yeah, mannequin sure. sucks. You can't do a great men's cut. Well, you, I mean, you can if you know what you're doing, but that's hard because the hair growth pattern and all the stuff, it's difficult. I think all of it is true. I, I think um, I only know my story, my perspective. I grew up with two sisters and a brother, but definitely a predominantly female household. I had tons of girlfriends. I will say, I know that I have sometimes a little bit more of a masculine energy. Like I've never had a problem getting along with guys, talking to guys that, that part of it was not hard for me. I literally didn't have the exposure. Like I, I had done all my sister's hair. I'd done my hair. I did everybody's hair for prom. Like that, that was like my comfort zone. That was just so easy. It was like, oh my gosh, now I've got to dip into this arena. Like I've never had a clipper cut. I don't know how, what's a taper around the ear. Like, because lining somebody up, like I didn't even know those things happened. So it was like the exposure to it. It was like the the journey to learn it felt so long for me, but that, you know, I had my exposure story. I think for some people it is maybe like being in more of an intimate situation with a man as a woman is not comfortable for everybody. And like the shampooing and all the stuff, like, I don't, I think it, I think it's all the things it's a hurdle to overcome for sure. It's a mental thing. Big time. Yeah. You know, it's also like different. Like when you see a men's haircut, you're looking at the hair different, right? You're not watching, how the are, but like, it's almost the opposite of watching a layer fall. Right. You're kind yeah. of like, and, and you're, and you're, and like you said, it's your, you're, it's more of a sculpting kind of thing than it is like a, 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 a thing. You said that you did all your, your, your sisters for prom, but you hate doing uh bridal hair. Hate huh. it. But, but listen, I, I was like an early two thousands. And so we all wore our hair down. Like it was so, you know, it's, everything is generational. Everything is different. It was not that big of a deal at the time. I'm curious to you all, did you have any intimidation doing like longer hairstyles, like layered cuts or bobs or something that you had not experienced before or did that fear not exist it didn't exist with it didn't exist with me uh -uh, not, i mean we i kind of but we when i started hair school and so everyone knows tony and i are not barbers although we're like people accuse us of being barbers all the time which by the way i would love to be a barber. like i watched that's a sweet now. gig let's let's give it up to the barbers like i have yeah, so much respect sure. i love that that section of the industry is having such like a huge i feel like in the last like five to ten years barbers are coming out on top oh. i've just loved to watch that section of the industry explode that's been so fun although half, although half my clients have shifted to to barbering oh i apologize 
<laughs> no, no, no. Like I literally, I got half, half men, half women. And, uh, and oh, you're still home. doing them. You're not saying they're leaving you to go to like a strictly barber shop. That's no, not what you're no, saying. No, okay. not at yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, I have a huge influx of, of, of barbering clients and, uh, especially young college and high school. Um, uh, yes. Because I think that stigma of like men can't take care of themselves or something. I don't even know what that ever was. Like that's gone. Like take care of yourself, go and have a great experience for yourself. That's been so fun to see. Yeah. Dude, Tony does the best, like lax, uh, 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 mullet you'll ever see in your life. Oh, I love that. Oh yeah. <laughs> He'll have to send you some pictures. They are pretty sick. I and need then, that. Yeah. And then, you know, once you do one, like awesome, like a, a, a lacrosse mullet, then you got everyone on like 12 teams looking for yeah. you. <laughs> oh, you're the lacrosse team mullet guy. That is such a zone of genius. I love that for you. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, 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 and, I, and I love all those young guys too. Cause they, uh, they're fun. Yeah. And then, then now they're talking about like, okay, so can we start, you know, maybe thinking about putting designs in and things like that. And, but it's, it's been, it's been awesome. It, and it just takes me out. Of, so I go from, I can go from a long hair, long layer to a short pixie to a, to yeah. a, a lacrosse mullet to, you know what I mean? Ice hockey or, or, or whatever. It's just, I, I love my day. Cause I get to bounce around. Okay. Can, we talk, about that? can yeah. we talk about that for a small second? Yeah. So okay. one of the things I coach to is like having a target market. And I think when I talk about that, people think like, oh, I've got to do one type of hair all day long. That's not what it looks like in my definition, but I could see how in the simplest form, when you say target market, it's like, oh, okay, so I do root touch-ups or I, okay, I do extensions or, you know, it would look and feel like that, but it's not true. I tend to think that you serve a target market clientele, both of you, but it doesn't necessarily mean all the same services. It could be all the same values. They like the conversation that's being had. It's the same energy. Do you think that describes your clientele or who is it do you, that you think you serve? Wow. That's a good question. I, I think it's the energy, the, the, yeah. vibe, the, the connections, the, yep. um, you know, I can, I can go from a shag to, to someone with beach waves to, to, to the mullet to, you know, and, and it's like, it's just the same conversation, same vibes. A lot of them, they yep. love the idea of, of, you know, just, being in our in our suite in our in our presence in our situation yeah. and it's just a just a cool thing the mm -hmm. cutest thing happened last week to tony um he was doing it was a 16 year old kid and he must have like asked tony a thousand questions about hairdressing and it was like the coolest kind of like conversation to not only watch the kid get fired up but tony was kind of fired up like like talking about the industry as a whole not necessarily him and his thing but the industry as a whole and that was like that was pretty dope. And especially in our area, because our area is 1000% like you go to Harvard or you don't go to college, you know, kind of thing. Like we're, this is the area that we're in. So to watch, and this is the conversation, like what were your SATs? How was it? You know, did you get accepted? You know, this is, this is a lot of times a conversation. So to watch this young kid get fired up about hairdressing, I don't even know why I was asking. Was it just, just curiosity? Yeah. Just strictly curiosity. It's the first time uh, that I've done it. I was doing his hair, you know, uh, another 16 year old referred him that, that's on his team. And uh, he was just so fascinated by, by what we do. I'll be so curious. You have to keep us updated. I'll be so curious if in a year and a half or two years, he enrolls. That's what, that's, that's what he said. He goes, does he want to apprentice? Does he want to, does he want to be mm -hmm. a, a barber? And I said, this is the first time I've done his hair. He just, you know, he was so curious, but yeah. And adorable. Oh, he was, yeah. Yeah, he was an awesome, awesome kid. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's amazing. Like, I think that's one of the things about our profession that sometimes we take for granted. I can tell you two are not taking it for granted, but like you made an impact on that young man that day. Like, that's so rad. And you were just there to do his haircut, but for him, it was so much more than a haircut. Like I, in my heart, believe that. You could have changed like literally the trajectory of his life. Like, that's the yeah. kind of work we do, man. And it's, Sometimes I think that, you know, there's this narrative that we have to do more and be more and achieve more. And it's like, man, you're impacting lives though already. I just think that the, what we can do for our community is more powerful than people give credit sometimes. We had a, we had an apprentice one time, um, Adrian, uh, who, uh, he couldn't, he didn't know where he wanted to go. What did he wanted to do? Sure. Brilliant, brilliant kid. Uh, but he, you know, he, uh, he apprenticed 
uh, because he just didn't know what he wanted to do quite. So he spent a summer with Corey and I, and uh, I still do his family's hair, but he's out in California. Now you're neck of the woods, but what he does is that he codes for NASA and he actually gets to drive the, uh, the, uh, the Mars, ro the Rover uh, on Mars. And, uh, he gets to program a lot of that, uh, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and wow. I get to see him once in a while uh, when he's, when he's back on the East coast, when he, you know, visiting his family, but uh, you know, he'll text me, Hey, you want to go have lunch or something? But he's uh, just a sweet kid, but it's like, he spent a summer with us and he was just so fascinated again with what, what we do with people and just, and it was just, you know, and when you have opportunities to, to pour into a young person's uh, life, you know, mm. do it with, with, unselfishness and, and you know what I mean? And, and grace and grace. Absolutely. Okay. I love that. Can we talk about apprenticeship and assisting for a minute? Yeah, yeah. for sure. I, I feel like I'm being bossy. I'm sorry. You could just oh, tell sure. me to stop anytime. Okay. What is y'all's take on like apprenticeship and assisting as it looks like now? I feel like there's a thousand ways to slice it. And there's a lot of differences of opinion. It, I'm curious as to how you all have tackled apprenticeship in the past and what you think it should look like today. I, I, I think it's changing, right? Like it just is. The conversation that you're seeing, like, like it's like people get out of hair school and then they immediately want to go on the floor. And, 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 and I said that and it sounded like with judgment, there's no judgment there. I'm no. kind of curious as to why, as, as to how this is happening and, and, and are, are people prepared to go on the floor? Are the schools doing a better job? Are they, you know, the, these are all the questions um, that I have is, 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 with, with apprenticeships. Um, I do think, and I certainly think that I was taken advantage of a little bit, not to like, you know, play the littlest fiddle or anything, but, but, um, you know, like I was an apprentice for like two or three years, you know, and I'm like, yeah, that seems a little excessive. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I well, some, some of us need more work. So. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but yeah, I, I, I am kind of, I'm, I'm curious to see like kind of how that evolves. Like, I don't really know if I really have an opinion about it um, as far as like what, what should be done or what shouldn't be done or whatever. Um, I just, I, I'm just kind of curious to, to kind of observe and, and see what's happening. Um, now I do know, as we all know, you know, social media changed the game, you know, like, like, like if an apprentice is bringing in a bunch of clients that are looking at their work, you know, that's, that's a different game, you know, that's, but, it, but to me, it's the same exact game as if you leave hair school and you go right into a sweep, you know, if, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're doing well in that, congratulations, but I would argue that probably 90% of us are going to, are going to drown in that situation. Agreed. You know, Agreed. but I, I, I think, I think as, as an apprenticeship goes, uh, you mean you're, not out of school? You're not well, not going to to cosmetology school. You're going to a salon to apprentice. Yeah. Um, you know that's and, and print. Wait, so time out. Apprenticing is legal where you are, correct? It's legal here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. It's okay. a two year Continue. program. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, same. Two year program. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, it's I personally I think, um, that you're going to gain a whole lot more faster in, in, in an apprenticeship program, right? Because by the time you go through, and I'm not knocking schools at all, uh, if you can do both, that it's, that, that'd be great. But usually you got to be full-time one or the other. Um, but you just get your hands on a little earlier in, as, in a, as an apprenticeship program. And uh, as far as um, a future stylist or future professional, I know if, Hey, you know what? I'm 90 days in and this is not really, uh, this is not really what I want to do. You can walk away without being 20, 30, $40,000 in debt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great point actually. Yeah. That's I agree. Really, but I, but I know these, these cosmetology schools that they don't, you know, I don't want them to, to be offended by what I'm saying either. Cause I know that they need, students in order to survive and, and there's been a lot of schools that been closing because of co you know not saying covid but just brought that a girl up again <laughs> uh <laughs> right uh so it's 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 a, but when you, you're going to have a little bit more freedom a little bit more in a school versus apprenticeship because you're going to be held accountable 
to to whoever you're to the bank yeah (laughs) literally all right Brent. i'm going to take us way off track but this is a conversation that i've wanted that i've been saving for you i haven't had this conversation with anyone except i was like i was like when i get to talk to Brent, i want to ask her about this um and this is just like a thought so it might not even be totally thought through but so you know you're you're the new best friend so you're the new best i know exactly she i know she texts me at night. This is not new information, okay? <laughs> so, Britt, here's my thought, and, and help me think it through. So, and, and, and let me finish my paragraph before you jump down my throat, too. So, so with, with, the, with, with, with AI coming into the world at such a strong rate, and with, with, with the predictors that so many people are going to be losing their jobs, and more, most importantly, I think where, what AI is going to do is it's going to take the jobs of creatives. Right. Mm. So then my question is, where do those creatives end up and do they end up in the hair industry? And if they end up in the hair industry, because we're like, we're going to be the creative job that that continues, hopefully, I, I don't see anyone in the near future going into a machine to get a haircut. But if that's the case, then how do we prepare as an industry for this influx of creatives that are coming? And and by the way, I'm going to double down and I'll just say that, that I think we need licensing more now than we ever did because if we're going to get this big influx of creatives coming into the industry then i think we need i think we need more licensing as opposed to like everyone jumping in and 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 not necessarily being prepared okay i have a lot of thoughts i'm going to start with the disclaimer because i've been speaking to this a little bit but not quite so directly i've been like speaking to it with kid gloves a little bit because recently in recent months i've been accused of fear mongering which is not a super new thing for me i'm used to it it's fine i can wear it The reality is I talk about what is happening. What is happening is scary. So me talking about something that's scary will feel scary. And I totally understand it freaks me out too. It doesn't mean, again, kind of what we talked about earlier. It doesn't mean we don't have the conversation. So I know that some of what we're talking about doesn't feel good going down. You will be so much happier to at least have been aware of what was coming versus being sidelined by it in five years when it's already here. So I just want to like share that disclaimer of like, I know what we're talking about is scary. It's uncomfortable. A lot of thoughts and feelings about AI and what's going to happen. And the truth is we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. We're not sure. So a lot of this is speculation. That being said, based on the data we're seeing and the trends that we're seeing and the reality that, yeah, a lot of jobs are going to become obsolete, just like that. This is, this is the way though. I think I was hearing, was it Gary Vaynerchuk? Somebody was talking about like, Everyone's freaked out about AI. Imagine how farmers felt in like the 1600s or whatever, the 1800s, when tractors started coming. They were like, oh my gosh, now my, my farm worker job is going to be gone because this machine's going to take it over. And then they found other jobs and they carried forward. Like technology is always coming for us. This is not like a new thing. But what is different this time is the rate in which it's coming. And that's what's feeling shocking. And I totally get it. I have said for the past year, winter is coming. Nobody likes it when I say that our industry is about to be hit so hard and all the trades, not just ours. Like my son is nine. I'm going to suggest to become a plumber. Like I'm not going to say, or a barber or like literally go into a trade. My daughter's going into a trade. So I'm, I'm like walking the walk. And as I talk the talk, because things are just changing so fast. Trades are the industry, at least at this point. That is, we know that they're recession proof. We've always said that they're fairly AI proof. There's, and it it will take time for robots to take over our jobs and and advanced technology and ideology to take over our jobs. We have a little bit more time. Yes, that is safe proof for us in some ways, but in other ways. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. (laughs) You're still here. Hi. 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 Hey. It safe proofs us in some ways, and in other ways, it makes us more vulnerable. So I've shared this. I don't know if you've heard me share this. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics predicts that our industry is the second fastest growing industry over the next 10 years, as far as people chasing new licensures, because people know the trades are where it's at. So when I say winter is coming, I'm not trying to fear monger. I'm trying to help people understand competition is going to get stiff. Like if you think our industry is saturated now, wait a decade and then come talk to me about it. It's going to get weirder. And so we have to be, and there's things we can do to safe proof ourselves for that. We have the upper hand. We're already here. And if we can be smart now, if we say, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. Though in a decade, you'll be in it. And that's just how it's going to go. And, you know, some people will make that choice and that's totally fine. But now we're at the, the, 
the front of it where we can start to make really good decisions to safe proof our businesses. But I do think our industry is going to get saturated. And to what you said um, about licensure, it really upsets me. The deregulation is the way we're heading. I'm in California. My daughter was the first graduating class of her cosmetology school. I did 1600 hours. She did 1000. The quality of her education Oh my gosh, it's, you can't even compare. And not that I got like the best top tier. I didn't graduate ready to go out and build a clientele either, but to lose a third of her hours, I could see it. I could taste it. I could feel it. Oh my gosh. And so the fact that we're heading that direction and we're going to get inundated, very scary, very scary. So you brought up like protecting, you know, our businesses and stuff. What, what, what are you coaching to? You know, how, 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 what can we do now that, that we're in the space to, to coach to like this potential in, in, influx? Yeah. So the big, the big phrase I'm saying right now is perceived value. So we all perceive value all the time, every day as consumers, when you go to buy a t-shirt, when you go to buy a frozen yogurt, when you go to buy a coffee, we're choosing certain businesses, certain services, certain providers based on the value we get with them. Some people choose to go to the local coffee shop down the street because they have a live guitarist every Sunday morning and they think that that's charming. So that to them perceives the value, even if maybe the latte is not as good, but you love that Joe comes and plays his guitar every Sunday, you know, the owner. So your perceived value in that is experiential. There's all these different things that we equate to perceive value as human beings beyond our industry. That's why I like to use examples of the coffee shop or whatever. In our salons, the way to get out ahead of this is to do more than just good hair because there are doing good hair is becoming easier and easier and easier all the time. Like the, the fact that education is at our fingertips is such a blessing. I wouldn't change it for a second, but now we have to realize there were years where you could rest your hat on your experience because you knew it was going to take 15 years for somebody to come up behind you and gain all those years of experience. It's not like that anymore. Instead of 15 years, it's going to take them a year and a half. And so now it's like, what are the things that you're going to do to set yourself apart? It's so interesting. Y'all have behind you right now recording this hat wall. And you were saying, oh, we're doing this new podcast setup. And it's all the hats of all of like the educators or brands that we worked with before. To me, that's a perceived value experiential shift. Most people don't do that. In our industry, you're going to have to do the things that most people don't do. You can't just have a sterile salon suite where you set up shop and you hang a poster on the wall and you're like, come on in, I'm great. That'll be you and every other new graduate in 10 years. We have to dig a little deeper. And is it harder? Yes, it is. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying, let's say we pick up the, so the Bureau of Labor and Statistics is predicting we're going to pick up 100,000 new cosmetologists specifically. So I'm not even talking about barbers, nail techs, lashes, I'm not talking about anything else. Specifically, cosmetologists, 100,000 within the next 10 years. That's a lot. That is an additional 10% pressure on our industry. And when I share that, a lot of people say, well, like, yeah, but people are going to fall off. Sure. But either way, the volume of people coming in is higher. So people fall off of everything all the time. The pressure is mounting. The only way is to set yourself up in a perceived value experiential way that sets yourself apart. I don't think it's going to be the social media game. I really don't think so. I think social media is going through its own identity crisis right now. I think it's what's happening within your four walls and really thinking about what can I do here that's special? What can I do here that's more than just good hair? I think is going to be the key. Do you, but, uh, okay. Do you think though, if the market's un oversaturated, that it'll also drop our prices? No, I Why? don't. Okay. Why, 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 would, why would like a, like a supply and demand have a different, have a different, um, you know, the rule number one, why would we break rule one? Okay. Supply and demand. True. How come Chanel still gets to charge like $40,000 for a handbag? There's plenty of handbags. You can buy handbags at Target now. I can get, I can get a, a used handbag at the thrift store. I can get a handbags at CVS if I want to, but a Gucci, a Chanel, a Louis Vuitton, still get to charge tens of thousands of dollars for what they offer. Yes. Yeah, sure. And that's, it also sells a handbag. So, I mean, w will there be a marketplace? I mean, I certainly know like during the nineties and stuff, like, you know, when hair, hair cuttery and all these, these plate, all these lesser brand, price, not lesser brands, but lesser price brands came into the marketplace that, you know, that was a big thing in the nineties. Do you want to get a $9 haircut? doesn't matter what I want. It does matter what you want. You're a consumer. Right, but, well, but I, I'm just asking you know for what? You. Let, me, let me rephrase the question. 
Yeah. Do you think that there's a place to where like some of these lesser brands will um, lesser price? I don't want to say lesser brands, lesser price brands. Do you think? Do you think that if we have all these stylists that are coming into the market, do you think that? Do you think that there will be another, you know, hair cuttery slash whatever, um, more of those in the marketplace? Like super cut. You're, talk you're talking about what I talked about. You probably didn't hear this. I have this uh, idea, and I got to think of a better name for it because it's so terrible. Ninja Turtles. I call them the Ninja Turtles. I'm a kid of the 80s, 90s. So Ninja Turtles were a big deal. And they're these crime fighting turtles that live in the sewer. If you don't know what they are, they're bottom dwellers. Now they're crime fighting turtles. So they're super cool. But if thinking of that, that concept of it's these people in the underground, there will always be a subculture. It's already bubbling up. There will always be a culture who tries to brand themselves on, I can do it and I can do it cheaper. It's already happening. I started talking about this in February of 2023. I get DMs every single week of people saying, got a Ninja Turtle in my area. It's already starting. The undercutting is happening. It doesn't change what you do as somebody who's experienced in the industry. So the reason I brought up the example of the Chanel bag Chanel didn't lower their prices when Target started selling handbags. Like, I don't know if everybody remembers what Target looked like 20 years ago. It looks nothing like it looked today. Target looked like a CVS um, or like a, a Walgreens, like a drugstore. It didn't look like it does now where it's clothes and groceries and all these other things. Chanel doesn't say, oh no, competition's getting stiff. I'm going to lower my prices because there's more handbags out there they stay strong and they increase experience and they increase the opportunity and they change their brand positioning. We have to do the same thing. That's such a great explanation. Of it. Oh. It, it, was, it is so true. I mean, even, even in our area, uh, you know, everybody has a different rate. Exactly. And, 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 and we're in a, uh, like a higher type salon suite. Uh, that has a, a front desk, uh, a beverage bar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A block away, there's a suite with uh, none of that, and it's lower rent and cheaper rent. And uh, the, the people that, that we rent from are not going to lower their rate just because somebody uh, down the street opened up a, a salon suite that you know is charging cheaper rent. No, and, and listen, this is all relative, too. So we know that people are going to potentially lose jobs because of AI, potentially, allegedly, right? We don't know for sure, but allegedly that's what's going to happen. Those people might need the $15 haircut joint now. They might not be able to pay 80. However, as things change, people will still come up and other people will say, I'm not getting my haircut for less than 80. And that's the thing too. Like we have to look at consumers as an ecosystem. It's never just one factor of anything. Like as our industry gets complicated, it gets complicated for other people too. And we'll, we will need more people offering $15 haircuts because there will be a market for that. It doesn't mean the market for 80, 120, $400 haircuts is going to fall bottom out. There st will still be a market for that. The question is, can you raise the way that you handle yourself, have conversations, navigate your clientele? to meet that raised bar? That's the question. I don't think that the price point needs to change. I don't think the industry is going to fall out. I think it's all going to come together just as it should. Yeah. I, I, I raised my men's haircut and, and, and you don't do men's haircuts. You're right. My barber haircuts. I, I raised my barber haircuts and was it my client telling you that you know, he didn't even, he said he saw it. He didn't even blink an eye about it. Uh -huh. he, it didn't question. Oh, not good. At all. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's it. I mean, Tony and I differ for this, but even when I raise my price, I never tell my clients, you know, I, I, I never do. And, and to be honest, I've had one conversation since I raised it with one, by the way, and it was the, the exact person I knew I was going to have the one conversation with, you know, from before, right. but, but yeah, every January 1st, I raise my prices and it's not, it just, it just happens. It just is. It just is. Yeah. It just, <laughs> Brit, um, I hear some big things are happening within the Brit Siva coaching world. What's uh, what's going on with the, uh, the the tour that we may or may not hear about? Thank you so much for allowing me to to chat about it. So um, we announced the Thriving Stylist Tour in early um, uh, summer of 2023. We've announced five dates so far. Our most recent date, Chicago, sold out in two minutes. So locations are going quick right now, but we are going to continue announcing locations throughout the U.S. Um, as the year goes on. About every month and a half, two months or so, we're announcing a new location. Um, you can follow me at Britt Siva on Instagram. Um, to hear the latest and greatest and um, 
see kind of what we're up to. Our other big um, exciting endeavor is that we're hiring coaches, which has been really wonderful. Nice. Um, and the coaches are definitely existing thrivers, but also I'm just hiring really passionate beauty professionals who want to get into the educational side of things, but maybe don't want to do it on their own. So if anybody's interested in that, you can hit me up in the DMs too, but that's another really exciting endeavor that we've started this year. That's like really on my heart. I'm really enjoying like this stage and phase of the journey. And it's been such a blessing. And my last announcement is I'm hoping to be joining my hair industry friends at um, Presley and Poe next spring. So fingers crossed we'll be there too. She just went public. <laughs> <laughs> now the pressure's on. Now the, the, yeah. Oh, oh and, and on that, if we're going public and we're putting pressure on people, let's put pressure on Britt's team. So uh, Britt may want to teach a class at Presley Poe and Friends. So, uh, you know, that, that could happen too. So that could be an East Coast stay here. Uh, if that could happen, if we can make that happen, that would be magical, magical, magical. Um, oh, back Man, to the that coach. could be part of your tour date. Exactly. Hey, this yeah, there you I'm go. Thinking. There you go. Yeah, this is what Perfect. I'm thinking. Britt, so... um. It's interesting, and, and and I hope I don't put you, like, I don't put some heat under your feet a little bit, but, like, so many people that we've watched you coach, and then and then many, 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 many of them, and by the way, Elizabeth Faye's in the same situation, not situation, but for a setup, it's like, many, many, many of those people went on to coach, and which I also, yeah. why there's so many coaches that are in this space now, so it's really cool that you're keeping some of the, 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 the some of the coaches in-house, that, that's amazing, congratulations on that. Thank you. It's been fun. And, you know, it's just kind of like opening up a suite, like independent education isn't for everybody. It can be really hard. And so the educators I'm bringing on are employees. So they're um, hourly or salary, they get benefits from me, health insurance, like it's kind of a cool gig. And so it's nice to be able to offer something that other educators maybe aren't able to get going independent or doing something else. And to get that mentorship, um, I'm, I'm training my coaches every single week. And so it's been a really fun way to be able to give back in a way that feels very meaningful and I still deeply support everybody that I've worked with who went on to coach and do their own thing because for some they can do it and it works right but it's just like some people go into a suite and it's a little harder than they thought it was going to be there's a there's another place to land and so it's been fun to offer kind of an additional opportunity all right more heat under your toes so uh so you have a salon they're just called coaches now yeah. right and like and like you teach them to be the best coach in the entire world how are you going to feel when they go independent I'm going to be okay with it because you know why my, my vision, I have a vision and a mission statement for my business. And my vision is to empower 1 million stylists to be six figure earners. I can't do that by myself. I've never thought that I could. And so if, if I mentor somebody and in two years, they're like, I can do this on my own. I've still done really good work. Like I'm still working with my vision. I hope that person does go on and teach teach really great classes. And if you take somebody's money, you give them your all. Like if they go on and do that, ugh, I, I'm still winning. Like I'm still happy for me. That's the joy is when I see the impact. So we're good. Well, that's awesome. Brett, I love the ripple yeah. the ripple effect, you know? So, so throw it out again. How can uh, everybody find out more about everything you're doing? Best place to start is probably on my Instagram at Britt Siva, but you can also head to thrivingstylist.com. We have lots of goodies and freebies and links and downloads and stuff there. Um, and if you check out the Thriving Stylist podcast, I'm dropping good stuff every Monday as well. That's awesome. Miss Britt Siva, my, my, my dear friend, push my this back the way. My dear <laughs> friend, Britt Siva. I'm used to it. <laughs> Britt Siva, thank you for hanging out with us. Thank you for dropping all your knowledge. Thank you for the conversation. I, I truly, truly, truly appreciate it. Um, and thank you very, very much for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends, give us a rating and drop a review to listen to all the latest podcasts. Please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet and to stay connected on and off the show. You can follow us at hair Street on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time. Peace and love.